in light of, of Sarah's talk, I kind of want to scrap everything I was going to talk about and, and, and talk about royal women and the laws. It'd be a, a really good melding, but I think that's probably for another time. Uh, as it is, I'm going to be talking about Joan, Lady of Wales, who, comparatively speaking, her life and her career is really the best well documented of any royal consort of, of medieval Wales. Um, and as such, historians have long acknowledged her and her influences and successes as an intermediary in early 13th century Anglo-Welsh relations. Uh, she was married to the ruler of the kingdom of Gwyneth, Llewellyn ap Yorworth, also, also known as Llewellyn the Great. And she's been recognized as, quote, an emissary whose diplomatic services far outran those of the Seneschal and those who helped him, Llewellyn, in this capacity for the greater part of his reign. To the assistance of his wife, Joan, both as an advocate and a counselor, there can be no doubt that he was much indebted. And I don't think this kind of surprise, uh, this kind of praise is very surprising because during his reign, Thwellen had a number of obstacles that he had to face. And he really needed a trusted member of his household to assist him in sort of the administrative duties of the realm that he was either unable or, you know, I think you could argue, argue unwilling to carry out in person. And Joan herself had a really unique uh, standing with the Anglo-Norman court. And her intercession certainly resulted in the realization of some of Llewellyn's uh, very political and diplomatic objectives throughout his reign. Um, to better understand Joan's place in history and her activities and perhaps even her life in general, it's really crucial to, for us to understand the socio-cultural context in which she operated, particularly as Thwellen's wife, you know, the, the, the royal consort. And more pointedly, however, I think it's really important to understand the context in which she operated and her status as a queen. Um, because any discussions about Joan or any discussions about Welsh queenship, uh, whether in theory or in practice, really go hand in hand. And I think this is for two reasons. The first is that Joan's reign was 30 years long and she really did actively support Thwellen's ambitions, acting both as a pol political diplomat and I think one of his lead counselors. And two, hers is the only reign of any wife of a native Welsh ruler that's really documented in any real way. So it's largely through Joan that we have to construct any understanding of what Welsh queenship may have actually been and operated in practice. And on the surface, the, uh, the, the stark absence of other Welsh royal consorts in contemporary source material leaves us to presume that Joan perhaps uh, enjoyed the status that she did with both in the Venedodian court and the Angevin courts simply because of her intimate ties. And well, yes, I think that this is true to a very large extent. It also needs to be stressed that Joan's own career should also be assessed not simply as the daughter of an English king or the half sister of an English king, whether or not she was illegitimate or even the wife of a ruler, but also as a queen and as a queen in her own right, who perhaps actually fulfilled some of the expected functions of her office. And these functions were defined by traditions and our customs um, of Welsh ideals, norms and perceptions of the royal wife and as they are laid out in Welsh sources. So today what I'm going to do is um, not to talk about Joan's life in its entirety, but I'm going to um, put it within the framework of political diplomacy. And I'll be referring to ideals and expectations of Welsh queenship that appeared in Welsh, Welsh sources in order to give more of a broader perspective of Joan and her activities, um, as, well, as well as her status. And then the second part, I'll be talking about whether or not we think she might be a model of Welsh queenship or if in fact she's an exception. And I'll be tying this at the end with a brief overview of uh, examples that we have from 12th and 13th century Gwyneth itself of other royal consorts where we have some records of activity. So in 1201, as the first real alliance between an English king and a Welsh prince, Joan, who was the illegitimate daughter of King John by an unknown woman referred to simply as Queen Clemencia in the Tewkesbury Annals, was uh, given over a uh, promise in marriage to Thwellen ap Yorworth. And it's interesting to note that 
prior to this particular alliance, Flellin may have been in negotiations to marry a princess of the Isle of Man. Uh, he even received papal dis dispensation to go forward with this marriage. Uh, but this woman may have actually already been married to his uncle or betrothed to his uncle. The earliest record that actually refers to Joan herself is dated in 1203 in which, quote, the king's daughter, end quote, sailed from Normandy to England at the king's own expense. And it's likely that it was at this time that Joan traveled to England as Thuan's prospective wife. However, we don't know where she was uh, between this time and the time that she married Thuan, and neither do we know actually the date of when they were married. Um, the Chester Annals record it as being the year 1204, whilst the Worcester Annals record it as being the year 1206. So I think looking at some of the different facts that we have that one, Thuan received papal dispensation to marry this princess of the Isle of Man in April 1203, but then rescinded the request in February 1205 coupled with looking at King John's itinerary and seeing that he was in Worcester in 1205, and the fact that the Manor of Ellesmere and Shropshire was gifted to the couple as a marriage portion in April 1205, I think it's very likely that Joan and Flown were married in March 1205, and this probably took place at Worcester. Um, as all royal marriages were, this is a, a political exercise, and certainly both Joan and Flown benefited from it. For Joan, she assumed a role of political diplomat and a counselor and acting on occasion as one of Flewellyn's principal arbitrators with the English crown. And she did this both during her father's reign and her, um, her, brother, her brother's reign, Henry III. Her first uh, political, her first appearance in the political stage is recorded in the Welsh Chronicles for August 1211, when she was sent by Llewellyn and quote, by the council of his leading men to seek peace with the English king on whatever terms she could, end quote. And this happened after a victorious uh, English military campaign in North Wales. And the terms that were negotiated were really quite harsh for Llewellyn. He lost a significant amount of land in Northeast Wales had to pay a huge ransom. Uh, but one of the biggest things he had to do was to hand over a large number of Welsh hostages of the noble elite. And one of the hostages was actually his own firstborn and illegitimate son, Griffith. And although these provisions for peace were really punitive to say the least, the overall success of Joan's mission as a diplomat in this case has long been attributed to her influences within the court based on her life cycles as Thuellen's wife and also as King, King John's daughter. And it's perhaps these are the defining factors that led Thuellen and his council clearly to send Joan as an envoy in the first place. But I want to argue that you know, her virtual status as a queen consort, coupled with the idea of the mid medieval queen's traditional role as this advocate of peace, as well as her relationship with her father, it's likely that she was involved in both counseling Thuellen on occasion, sorry, both counseling Thuellen on the negotiation strategies, and perhaps even negotiated some of the terms of this treaty herself. And I will come back to that aspect shortly. In spite of the severity of, of of the occasion of, of 1211 and, and all the things that Flellen had to deal with. It seems that the cordial relations between the two families um, resumed because it's recorded that in, uh, what is it, in Easter, um, at Easter in 1212, Joan and Flellen actually spent a, a court in Cambridge with the king. And interestingly enough, late in the summer, both the chroniclers Roger Wendover and Matthew Paris both give credit to Joan with forewarning her father about a baronial conspiracy to take his life, or in the least uh, to kidnap him and take him hostage if he pursued another planned invasion of Wales. Uh, William the Lion, the King of Scotland, is actually noted as being the other informant. Eventually, John took the threat seriously and he called off the invasion and went back to London to deal with the suspects of this conspiracy. Joan seemed to continue her formal diplomatic role between the years 1214 and 1215, which she successfully petitioned for the release of some of Flewellyn's men who were actually being held by the Crown. I think these were probably um, some of the Welsh hostages that had to be handed over in 1211. 
Chancery records state that four men were released by the king, quote, at the petition of our daughter, the wife of Llewellyn, end quote, in 1214. And then there was a fifth in 1215 who was released at the behest of the king's, quote, beloved daughter, end quote. So it's also most likely that these petitions were formally submitted in writing given their mention in the uh, chancery enrollments. And this is really important to note because as they allude to formal documentation, it then alludes to the fact that these were formal undertakings of, of petitioning by Joan herself in an official royal capacity. Between 1216 and 1220, we don't know anything about her. Uh, records are really quiet, but I don't think that this is, um, it's perhaps not coincidental because it was the period after John's death and it was also the period with the accession of the young King Henry in which uh, the relations between Gwyneth and England were pretty amicable and it allowed Llewellyn time to um, reach ascendancy in his own right. But it's during the 1220s and the 1230s that Joan actually continued her diplomatic ventures as the main representative of Llewellyn with the Angevin court, and she received assurances of safe conduct on a number of occasions to meet with the king. So for example, in 1220, she and her son Dabith were taken into the protection by the English crown, possibly uh, in anticipation of Flan actually acknowledging Dabith as his legitimate and chosen heir. And the pronouncement of Dabith as Flan's successor was royally endorsed by the king at Shrewsbury in May but it was also a decision that was supported and recognized by the papacy. So this is where we go back to this treaty of, of 1211 um, and, and why it was so important and why Joan may have played a, a direct role in things. Um, Flo's decision not only to declare Dabith as his chosen successor was important for a number of reasons, but the fact that Joan and Thwell and themselves throughout their lives um, did a number of things to ensure Davis' own successorship was secure is also of note. Um, there's no actual, uh, there's no actual record of Joan participating in the outlining these um, terms of the treaty or the agreement, but in view of her position as uh, Thwellen's principal intermediary and as well as her status as queen, it'd be surprising, I think, if she did not uh, involve herself in the negotiations or in at least initiate some of the terms of the agreements herself. And I think that the leading indicator for this is the fact that there's an article that stipulates that if Llewellyn actually died without an heir by Joan, um, his lands would a sheet to the crown. So yes, as far as it can be told, this is sort of Llewellyn's own aspiring policy to have a son by Joan be recognized as a successor. But she also may have provided impetus uh, for this strategy as well. It's most likely she was pregnant at this time um, with Davith, not that they knew that they were having a son, but you know they are already had a couple of other daughters at this time. And it would have been the most obvious way to, to further ensure the future of not only her own male progeny, but also her family as a whole. And this particular clause had a direct impact on Welsh polity itself. Concubinage and the recognition of illegitimate children as heirs were both cultural practices within Wales at this time. And as such, Llewellyn's son Griffith was actually a legal contender as Llewellyn's heir. So having to agree that a son by Joan was his legitimate successor, this meant rejecting Griffith and Griffith's own recognized patrimony. And more importantly, in much broader terms, it meant rejecting native custom and replacing it with wider European practices of primogenitor. And agreeing to these, adhering to these, these changes in customary practices in terms of wealth succession meant that the management of Flawlands Court, the Venedodian Court, became much better aligned and better established with European traditions. And this in turn likely worked to help elevate Gwyneth's status further above those of the other Welsh kingdoms. And Joan's own position within the Angevin family, namely her status as a royal daughter, surely allowed Fuellen some understanding and a more intimate access to the workings of, of the English court and especially John's government. And it was a connection that probably provided Llewellyn with strategical insights 
how best to secure royal recognition for his objectives and his choice of succession, which were clearly detrimental to um, the future prosperity of, of his own realm long after his death. So Davith was formally acknowledged as Llewellyn's legitimate heir by hereditary right by both the English king and the papacy, but it was done in a way that deliberately underscored his blood ties to the English crown through his maternal line, i.e. Joan. So the overall results of this 1211 agreement arguably elevated Joan's own queenly status, um, effectively showcasing the political significance of her maternity and her Angevine origins, but also her undertakings as, as an emissary. Yet they also turned and in, called into question her own illegitimate status and its effect on the family, her own family. So it's probably for this reason that six years later in the spring of 1226, she actually requested papal dispensation to be legitimized herself. And papal support for Davith's legitimate succession was reaffirmed in this exact same year. Instructions to uh, some leading Welsh bishops to ensure that the fealty that was given to Davith by Welsh magnates at the directive of the king remained unbroken. And um, this was a, a new position for her that made her an official and a legitimate member of the Anglo-Norman family. And this likely helped further enhance her own status and that of her family. But it's also really important in terms of, of reinforcing Davis' authority as eventual ruler. That Joan was particularly active as well in three, after three failed royal invasions in Wales, uh, one that occurred in 1223, uh, 1228 and 1231, really add further credibility to the notion that she really was Flewellyn's preeminent envoy who wielded a, a great significance. For example, in 1224, as the Lady of North Wales, uh, Joan was granted safe passage to meet with Henry at Worcester to facilitate the groundwork for a peace conference. And the King actually orders his exchequer to reimburse the Sheriff of Shrewsbury towards Joan's own travel expenses. And in this instance, it appears that her political efforts were rewarded because she was given the manor of Rothley in Leicestershire in 1225. So in 1226, in August, Joan was accompanied by Flewellyn and Davith to meet with the King at Shrewsbury. And again, it seems that Joan's political diplomacy was rewarded by the King who granted her another manor, and this time it was Condover in Shropshire. The couple, the royal couple also received other gifts from the English King, but it seems that Joan in particular um, received further rewards because in 1227, she was excluded from paying tallage on these manors that had been previously gifted to her. And the king even re recommended that the tenants of these manors reimburse her with reasonable aid. In 1228, after receiving self, uh, sorry, after receiving uh, protection of safe conduct, Joan and her own officials uh, met with the king again at Shrewsbury to negotiate an armistice. And it's interesting in this instance that the king uh, warned the marcher lords not to molest Flewellyn on his way because there was this presumption that Flewellyn would also be attending and he didn't. He just totally relied on Joan to be the main arbitrator. I think one of the most significant testaments to Joan's actual undertakings and status as a diplomat, and I do argue as queen, occurred in October of 1228 on the 13th as Llewellyn's chief ambassador and as a royal mother, uh, Joan accompanied Davith from North Wales to Westminster, uh, where she witnessed her son pay homage to the English king as the successor to the kingdom of Gwyneth. And though on a personal level, of course, she, she had occasion to, to be there, her appearance in court during the payment of homage and the confirmation of wealth vassalage is hugely important. Clearly her role as a queen and, and she was the leading Welsh representative of Venedotian power in the absence of her husband at this time. So being there, she was displaying her official status as the visible base of royal Welsh authority. Of course, you know, uh, as life goes with such highs, there came some real lows and there was a certain event in Joan's life, which in some ways um, has hitherto cast a real shadow 
over her career and our understanding of her. And this is most famously an episode that occurred in 1230. Uh, the Welsh Chronicles again tell us that, quote, in that year, William de Breos the Younger, Lord of Brachinog, was hanged by Lord Thwellen and Gwyneth after he'd been caught in Thwellen's chamber with the King of England's daughter, Thwellen's wife. William de Breos was one of Thwellen's greatest enemies and had been captured by the prince uh, in September 1228. And although this is unfounded, it's widely believed that it was during this time, uh, during his imprisonment, that Joan and him began some sort of liaison. And of course, the nature and the depth of this relationship is completely indeterminate. But um, William was released in early 1229, excuse me, with promises of paying um, 2,000 pounds in ransom and also to never take up arms against Thwellen again. And William also agreed that his daughter, uh, his eldest daughter and his heiress, Isabella, would uh, marry Jabbath as well. And it's a contract that certainly promised Thwellen um, greater authority throughout the southern, southern provinces. And it was probably during the time of, of Easter 1230 that uh, William came to visit Joan and Thwellen at their court, likely to hash out the details of this marital agreement um, that this affair was exposed. An entry in the Chester Annals contend that while de Breos was hanged for his insurgency, quote, the woman was imprisoned for a long time, end quote. In fact, Joan's imprisonment lasted only a year because she apparently seems to have been released from custody around 1231. So it's here that we really need to, um, in this context, look back at the, some of the Welsh sources and see what they tell us about Welsh queenship and the placement of the queen in the Welsh court, as well as her roles and the duties that are associated, um, because this becomes really important. So from a number of Welsh sources, from things like the Mabinogian and the triads and court poetry, um, proverbs and grammar, um, again, these are based on a much, much oral tradition. As, our, as Sarah had pointed out, the laws of Hoyalda, that this appears in as well, the lives of saints, uh, the life of Gurfath of Canaan, as well as the narrative of Gerald of Wales about his ventures through Wales. It really does appear, looking at the collective of evidence across these genres, that the queen enjoyed real levels of responsibility. And um, she was also able particularly to employ certain symbols and rituals associated with her status as the queen, but as the king's wife as well. And the, the most specific rituals and symbols are those associated with the ideals of the Welsh ideals of hospitality. Um, so ensuring guests and the members of the court were provided for, having the queen engage in informed discussion, symbolic gift giving to visitors, as well as the crucial role of the queen as the traditional, what we know as the cupbearer. She is directly located at the center of courtly life and all of these sources. And this suggests that the queen's presence was both accepted and probably recognized as being highly important. And overall, there's a real general presumption that in the sources, um, in the, sorry, in sources is that the general household, and to really an extent, it can also be argued attendance in court, is that the queen and king were actually expected to be together. There are also further illustrations and sources of the queens going on circuit, ruling territories jointly or independently, dispensing judgment, and even fighting or mustering for troops uh, for battle. And all of these examples really sort of beg the question, you know, was there really a, a no place for the queen at the table, so to speak? Um, and this is referring back to the actual Welsh laws, which don't actually provide the queen a seat at the high table when lying out uh, the officers in the high table. I think, in fact, looking at it and, and on deeper uh, investigation, there emerges a really distinct cultural image of the queen in medieval Welsh sources. And this is one that presumes there's more of a fluidity of movement for the actual queen between the court and the realm that were associated on occasion with political expectations relative to her office. Early laws actually indicate that the king's chamber itself was at the heart of, uh, was at the heart of the court and that the queen was in proximity. 
uh, there's some archaeological evidence that also shows that there was some sort of connection between the royal chambers. And there are a number of images found in things like the Mabinogian and the lives of saints in particular, where eating and entertaining and drinking and official administrative decisions actually take place within the royal chambers or just outside the royal chambers, which seem to be the real hub of activity for both women and men. So again, certainly the, the queen's close proximity to the king meant that she was really hardly on the periphery of, of any action. It's because um, the intimacy of this chamber, and I think you can argue as well, the high table within the hall afforded a venue um, for, for social and political circles that were really essential for uh, the networking of politics and the fulfillment of royal obligations that were defined by the court itself. And these definitions, I think, really included the supposed idea of a partnership between the queen and king in terms of their visibility, which helped really strengthen um, the visibility of, of rulership as a whole. So all of this kind of points us back to this really curious entry in, in the 1230 Brit Atosogion relating to Joan's assumed affair with this William de Breos. I think it's an intriguing entry for a number of reasons, not least of which what it might reveal about the political expectations and the visibility of the Queen's court within the place of the Royal Chamber, which again is the hub of activity. Importantly, I think it, that Joan was allegedly found in Flewellyn's chamber is important to note um, because it, it shows that there may have been an accepted placement of the Queen at the heart of the politi political sphere. And regardless really of what happened in 1230, uh, the silences of the sources, the Welsh sources on the matter of Joan, Joan's own incarceration, coupled with her reinstatement at Flewellyn's side, not only as his wife, but as a political active consort, and this was only a year after her imprisonment, suggests that, that her reputation and her importance as a queen and previous and previously successful diplomat, which of course she was, really far, far outweighed any breach of marital infidelity. So it's also likely no coincidence, I don't think, that Joan was reinstated at a time of renewed tension between Flewellyn and England's Justicar Hubert de Burr. Flewellyn's representatives had actually failed uh, to find any resolution to this brewing conflict that was going on while meeting with the king at Worcester in the summer of 1231 and eventually conflict broke out. So in 1232, Joan met with Henry at Shrewsbury on no less than three occasions. Um, there were guarantees of safe conduct given to her at these times, sometimes on occasion with her son Dabith, and also sometimes on occasion with Llewellyn's Seneschal Edmund Weichen. But that Joan was the main player to receive safe conduct each time really intimates that these really important ambassadorial missions were led and were perhaps to be led by Joan specifically. It's also during this particular time period in which Joan issued a letter to the English king. And in fact, it's our only surviving document of Joan herself. And I think it's the, one of the greatest demonstrations of her diplomatic um, capacity, her use of Welsh royal authority and her function of the royal office in her own right. In this letter, she says to the king that she's, quote, grieved beyond measure, end quote, and that it was her belief that he was being ill-advised by his counselors who and was allowing them to sow discord uh, between the two of them. And this is sort of a discord that led, she said, to enmity and distress. Joan begged the king on on bended knee and the shedding of tears to both reconcile with Llewellyn and to have faith uh, in the loyalty of their shared royal clerk. Importantly, she said to the king, quote, if you have wished to have confidence in me for anything else, put your faith for me in this. This is one surviving document of Joan's um, formal use of her newly adopted title, Lady of Wales. And it indicates that this letter in particular was, was official and a politically motivated petition. Um, before I go further, there's a brief note that needs to happen here at this juncture on terms of titles and designations. Um, I don't have time to delve into the real complexities of talking about the royal consort's wife, uh, the king's wife, 
uh, and, and the term queen that's used throughout uh, Welsh sources. Um, so what I'm going to do is sort of pare this down to a really simple explanation that there was a real diversity in the designations and definitions that Welsh rulers used um, at this time. And they did so in a way that, that was able to highlight the nature and the breadth of their own individual rule. And it was a rule that was defined by the political circumstances at the time and a way that sort of underscored the more centralized power within their own kingdoms. Um, in essence, it's sort of adopting various titles was a deliberate means of demarcating this imperial authority. So the fact that Llewellyn, it needs to be noted, used the title prince, doesn't actually mean that his authority was of any lesser standing at all. In fact, for all intents and purposes, we really can accept it and probably should accept it as being a variation of the title of king as we understand it. The official change in Flewellyn's own title around 1230 from Prince of North Wales to the Prince of Aberfrau and Lord of Snowdon was a means of him demonstrating this authority and it's a, an authority he saw as a ruler of all Wales. And the, the Prince of Aberfrau is a title that harkens back to the legendary um, ideals that the Kappa of Aberfrau and Anglesey was the head of the Venedotian dynasty and the rulers of Gwyneth in particular were to be the heirs of the rulers of Wales as a whole. So this important change in Flowland's own title was really mirrored to changes in Joan's title when she was roughly around the time she was released from prison from Lady of North Wales to Lady of Wales. So as the designations of royal wives were generally commensurate with those with their husbands, this change in Joan's own formal title reflects Llewellyn's standing as an exceptionally significant ruler. Moreover, the designation is also reflective of Joan's own queenly status and that of her official office. So in spite of not actually using the term queen, um, the, nature, the nature of this title that the Lady of Wales evokes is really this impression that both the office and the individual were recognized as being exceptional. And just because, like Flewell and Jones never referred to as queen in sources, doesn't mean that she wasn't actually viewed as one in essence by her contemporaries. Uh, hers was definitely a venerated status and it was a position as a wife of a particularly important, powerful ruler. And as the power and authority of Flewellyn's has remained unparalleled really throughout history, Joan's own position and her status equally has mirrored that and in context is proportionate to that of the idea of the medieval queen. I also think that the use of her title um, is, is crucial to the dating of the actual letter itself, which again harkens back to this idea of the importance of Joan being an official mediator. As Llewellyn and Joan's changes in title occurred around 1230, this intercession with this letter had to have taken place sometime after that. And it's possible that the letter can be dated between February 1232, when their clerk instruct us received safe conduct to meet the king at Westminster, and before Joan's own meeting with the king in May of that year. But I think more accurately, it's likely that Joan's letter was sent after March 12th uh, 1230 following the failed visit of another of one of Flewellyn's envoys to Westminster in which correspondence between the two courts really refers to a breach in truce. So if this was actually the case then it was a really strong indication of just how important Joan's own role was as an official mediator, um, not only as it was perceived but how it was very much needed as well. Her last recorded involvement as a diplomat occurred in uh, November 1235, when Henry granted a request of a petition, again from the Lady of Wales, for the pardon of one Robert of Reginald, who was accused in the death of one William, uh, son of Ralph of Credenhill. Joan died two years later in February 1237, probably in her late 40s, early 50s. So with this really brief view of Joan's diplomatic career, um, we're moving on to the second part of the discussion where we're thinking about her as being a model of Welsh queenship or perhaps an exception. 
I think it becomes pretty clear that looking through all the genres of, of Welsh sources, um, that it's the person of the queen or the persona where there's this, this maximum status is really envisaged. And it's based not just on her position within the court, but it's also, I think, based on her activities and roles and agency that's ascribed to uh, the, the status of the queen. You think about the fact that the queen did go on circuit. She did have powers in the law of providing protection and moreover had her own patent seal, her own coffers and officers associated with certain administrative duties as laid out in the laws. And again, examples of all of these occur again in the um, literary sources too and narratives. I think all of this implies that there really was this perceived office and the status of the queen. And it was one that seems to perhaps been compromised of, comprised of very real political responsibilities and prerogatives. I think this impression is also furthered by examples of royal women throughout native Wales who were involved in the administration of actual dynamic lordships through the receiving, the granting and the alienations of lands. We have a, we have a few examples of these. A lot of these are actually from South Wales. Um, but they, there are examples themselves that clearly demonstrate that women within some royal Welsh dynasties not only had real powers of land assigned to them, but their rights to exercise authority were personally expected and in some way socially accepted. So even if they were only doing the, the bidding of their husbands or other male family members by offering support in purely terms of a symbolic capacity, the fact that we have evidence of women being seen to participate in what are essentially matters of the realm is important enough, especially within this context. So just how different were Joan's own royal activities in comparison with her predecessors and her successors? I mean, you know, can we say she was an exception or a model? Well, let's have a quick look at um, what some of the records say about uh, her, her predecessors and her successors. So in the biography of Griffith of Canaan, the 12th century ruler of Gwynedd, uh, Griffith's own queen, Angherid, is noted for being wise and prudent, but she's also noted and importantly noted as a woman of good counsel. So there's a Latin version, an earlier Latin version of this life of Griffith, but there's also a Welsh vernacular version of the life of Griffith, which, which was written in the 13th century, probably during Joan and Llewellyn's own reign. And I'm pointing this out because in this Welsh version, uh, the Queen Angherid is specifically described as a Kingorek or a councilwoman. And she's also, as Queen Dowager, was bequeathed half of her husband's success possessions. There are references that are also found in the native um, chronicles and in court poetry of Kristen, who was the second wife of Owain Gwyneth uh, in, the, in the 12th century and Angherid's own niece, who was believed to have been involved in political treachery that saw one of her sons, Davith Apwine, come to power. Davith was also Fuellen's uncle. The expectation that Davith's own wife, who was actually Emma of Anjou, uh, Henry the Second's second, sorry, Henry the Second's half sister, uh, that she was supposed to act as a political mediator and an intermediary, intermediary is intimidate, intimated by both Gerald of Wales and in the Welsh Chronicles. Emma herself actually issued her own acta, and she did this whilst her husband was in power, and also importantly while he was in English exile. She used her own seals and even employed some of the same witnesses that her husband did on occasion. The most prominent and leading example of Welsh queenship and practice other than Joan stems from her contemporary and technical daughter-in-law. This is Sinana Firth Caradog, the wife of Griffith, Llewellyn's firstborn son and the one that was the legal contender to the succession of Gwyneth. Sinana is known to historians for her political dealings with Henry III in an attempt to secure her husband's freedom from prison because she was the one that both petitioned the king and even met with the king in 1241 to, to negotiate an agreement. And Sanaa's involvement in the production of the agreement itself, she affixed both her own seal and her husband's and she also swore on holy relics, demonstrates her diplomatic agency and it demonstrates that it was really critical to the process and to the outcome. And 
In fact, Sanana herself is arguably, I think, a queen in waiting. And she was a key player in the complicated socio-political relationship that was going on at the time within Gwyneth, but also between Gwyneth and England. For Sanana, her singular importance is actually the fact that she was from a Welsh royal family herself. And so Sanana kind of provides us a, an example of uh, a particularly Welsh slant really to understanding what native queenship was and how it may have been practiced or accepted on, on various occasions. Then we have Eleanor of Montfort, who, Eleanor de Montfort, who was the wife of Llewellyn of Griffith. Uh, Eleanor was viewed as a serious threat by her cousin, Edward III. And as her acta shows that even during her really short four-year reign, she was already successful in some ways as a petitioner and was already involved in political mediation with the crown. And then we have one last example, and this is Elizabeth de Ferrers, who was the wife of Davith Ap Griffith, uh, the last prince of an independent Wales. Uh, Elizabeth, as documented, is actually traveling to England to plead for mercy. And this was at the height of, of the Anglo-Welsh conflict that subsequently resulted in the end of native, native Welsh rule in 1282. So against this backdrop of sort of a century's worth of almost successive Venedotian queens partaking in, in various aspects of political endeavors and, and the idealized expectations that are set out in sources, it starts, to, it starts to seem that Joan's own activities become less extraordinary, really. So I just kind of want to conclude by summing this up by saying that um, in many circumstances, we know that the doors that opened for, for women, for medieval queens to exercise any sort of agency or, or power was usually familial. And of course, this makes sense, doesn't it? When we're thinking about the dynastic issues and the powers at play with state were also very closely involved. And it's in this context that Joan has actually been assessed um, by historians, but it's, it's herein um, lies the real main caveat to arguing whether or not Joan is a singular model of Welsh queenship. It may be that the actual agency that she exercised herself was in correlation with her ties to the Angevin court and Glenna's prominence during her reign. I mean, it was clearly within the realms of Anglo-Welsh relations that she was provided the greatest scope to, to even have any form of a career. And it's arguably her status within the Angevin court itself elevated her activities. But it's really important to recognize that Joan's activities also helped elevate Gwyneth's standing itself. It may be as well, thinking about the language and the customs that Joan herself would have brought from the Anglo-Norman courts uh, as a consort, perhaps helped her establish this political role and uh, her own role as a Welsh queen. As an outsider, it's possible that her status and the practice of queenship was really exercised in a way that was distinctive to her situation and the situation of 13th century Wales. And this would make her an exception then to how Welsh queenship was practiced rather than being a model in its purest form. I mean, Flewellyn himself clearly understood the need and the value of having an advisor and an envoy whose status and skills and qualifications um, matched both the requirements of really these diplomatic missions at hand, but also reflected the prominence of his actual status as a ruling sovereign. And so Joan's own status as Flewellyn's wife really suited these political needs. But she also met those needs, I argue, as a queen consort, because she likely uh, was employed as an official diplomat because of both her position as a, an international bride and because such a role was part and parcel of this queenly office, defined however loosely across uh, these Welsh sources and established by these Welsh cultural ideals in accordance with a woman of her status as a, as a married woman, to, you know, a woman married to a, a, a ruler. Even if for Joan, this was sort of on this grander stage that took her beyond Wales and, and moved her into England and dealing with the courts of England. I mean, surely upon entering Wales as a young bride, Joan would have been educated in the ideals um, of Welsh queenship. 
you know, and these included the traditions of the Queen's Circuit, the administrative duties regarding her own treasury and the production of documents, as well as the visibility of the court as the hostess and her potential role as a mediator. And in conclusion, considering this um, list of the Venedotian consorts from the 12th and 13th centuries, as well as their collective activities, it seems that these women also undertook some formal roles and duties within their own queenly status, and that their public interactions on behalf of the realm were accepted on occasion. So I think with this in mind, it's pretty safe to say that Jones not offered to us only as an example or as the only model of Welsh queenship. I think it's only because she's the better documented. Thank you. Have you had any questions, uh, Kirsten? Yes, I have. So um, uh, one of the uh, questions I've had is from Jane Higgins and she wants to know how Joan was viewed by the people of Wales, um, mm. Welsh people. Yeah, that's, you know, that's really almost impossible to tell. It's, it's really frustrating. Um, I think with, well, with Welsh women in particular in the Middle Ages, um, even with someone like Joan, it's just really difficult. You know, it's sort of a blessed and cursed um, research uh, subject to sort of delve down because there isn't, there isn't a lot at all. Um, and certainly with documentary material, there really isn't anything. Um, which is why I was sort of focusing on the ideas of things like some of the Welsh sources being silent on her incarceration, for instance. I mean, I think that silence speaks volumes in so many ways. Um, yeah, we just, we just don't know. I mean, you know, she was an outsider, wasn't she? She was a member of the Algevin courts. I mean, she may have not been liked, but but she also did so much for Welsh, for, for the Welsh and, and for Thlon in particular, that she may have you know, endeared herself. It's, it's just impossible to know, unfortunately. Yes. There was, of course, a number of questions about uh, the run-in with William de Braille. Yes, yeah. um, one saying, would the elevation of Joan to Lady of Wales around 1232 be taken now as her husband recognising that the charges against her were actually political and that his wife was innocent? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, this is a really complicated subject to, to talk about, but yeah, I do think one of the reasons that they changed their titles was to sort of elevate their reputation after this scandal, if you want to call it that. Um, I think it's pretty debatable whether it's, whether it was an amorous relationship that they had or whether it was political. Uh, I do think that there was some sort of political undertakings going on, um, but yeah. I know that um, Llewellyn was desperate for the um, marriage to the uh, heir of de Braos to go ahead and that he wrote some quite um, interesting letters to Ava, um, you know, almost begging that the marriage goes ahead. Yes. Um, yeah, he's very, yeah, he's very conciliatory in his letters, isn't he? Exactly. Um, so uh, the, one of the other questions which sort of touches on that is, um, do you think as a granddaughter of the incredible Eleanor of Aquitaine, Joan may have inherited some of her grandmother's charm and, and diplomacy? And what is your opinion on uh, William de Braos's death being, for want of a better phrase, a honey trap plot by Joan and Clewellyn? Okay, well, so for the first one, I mean, you know, yes, I mean, Eleanor was her grandmother, whether she knew her or not, she knew of her, didn't she? And, and I think it's really important to think, um, to recognize the fact that Joan's aunts and her sisters and her cousins, most of them were, were queens themselves, um, you know, whether it was Scotland or Castile or, or France. So she was very aware of, of all of these uh, customs associated with medieval queen, but you know, surely Eleanor of Aquitaine may have had some sort of impact on her, whether um, whether just through stories that she heard or just uh, random knowledge. As for uh, again with the affair with William, um, a part of my thing is Joan being uh, my main obsession and research subject. You know. This, this whole affair, she, you know, doesn't need to be defined, defined by this, you know, she was so much more involved, as we've seen, 
a little bit in 13th century relations. Um, yeah, I don't know if it was a honey trap. Again, I think it was it was um, Norgate, wasn't it? In, in the Welsh Dictionary of Biography early on in the early, early turn of the century who suggested that it might have been some, some political ploy with Flewell and the Joan being involved in it. And um, I do think that we need to open up discussions about this, um, about this affair. If Joan was used as sort of a honey trap, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know whether how willing she would have been or, or perhaps even unwilling. There are so many um, consequences of, of what actually happened. I mean, when you think about what actually happened and that Llewellyn hanged uh, William de Breos, I mean, he wasn't really technically in a way allowed to do that, was he? Because William wasn't his vassal. He was the vassal of the English king. So that just opens up this, this huge um, Pandora's box. And then you have to think about sort of the, the relationships, the personal relationships that are going on within the family. I mean, Davith himself, you know, looking at the acta, Llewellyn's acta, it seems that Davith himself was probably there when William's um, sentence was given, you know, and he would have been like 14, 15 years old at the time. So you have to think about all of these interpersonal relationships that are going on and how it affects the, the family as well. You know, I think that that's important. So, yeah, I don't, what was the bit about, what was the rest of the question? Um, sorry, it was um, just whether you thought it was a honey trap plot by Joan and Llewellyn. Yeah, I, I, I again, I, I do think that there were some uh, political dealings. I mean, I can't imagine, there was a lot for her to lose if it was just actually an affair. I mean, obviously with emotions, you can't, you know, deny that that may have happened, but I think there was almost too much to lose for it to be simply that. Okay, um, another one uh, here from uh, Sarah um, saying, um, so Ellen clearly would have had benefits from this political marriage. Uh, what was the benefit to King John back in England? Oh, well, I mean, I think that on a personal level, I think that John and Joan were relative, well, not, I don't know how close they were, but they were clearly close enough, um, you know, for her to spend Easter with him, for instance. And I do think that he was probably there to witness her marriage to Llewellyn. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for John, I mean, he, he was infamous, wasn't he, for his wanting to sort of play people against each other. And that's really what he was doing in Wales. So to have one of his own children and his daughter be integrated within the Walsh court um, would be an easy way for him to try to manipulate things. Now, whether Joan was easy manipulated or not, that's, that, you know, is, is arguable. And clearly she, again, fulfilled her role as Swellen's wife and helped him meet his objectives. But yeah, it, it, was, it was totally beneficial for John to yeah. have his daughter. And, 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 the most, you know, the premier Welsh court, right? Yeah. I guess.